now that you have a taste of what our Just Like Daddy stories are, let me introduce our keynote speaker for this inaugural program. Our guest speaker is General Larry O. Spencer, United States Air Force retired. General Spencer spent more than 40 years in the Air Force, beginning his career in the enlisted ranks and rising to become a four-star general. General Spencer's last assignment was the Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force. After retiring, General Spencer continued to serve and take care of the troops as president of the Air Force Association for four years, and most recently was named president of the Armed Forces Benefit Association. Fittingly, General Spencer has his own Just Like Daddy story. General Spencer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael, for that introduction, and I uh, really appreciate it. And Really happy to be here and uh, really compliment you all on, on recognizing fathers and uh, those that, in my case, that had a, fa have, have a father that served in the military. Most of you may be aware that I grew up over in uh, Southeast DC. Um, as a kid, uh, it was interesting to me uh, to watch my father uh, wake up every day and go into work in uniform. He was an enlisted man. And there was no one else on my block that had a father in the military. So it was sort of unique uh, for me to have a dad uh, that came home every day uh, dressed in his uniform with his stripes on. The other unique thing about my father was uh, he wore a hook uh, in place of his left hand uh, because he had his left hand amputated during the Korean War, um, and he, for which he received the Purple Heart. Uh, one of the things that was uh, interesting about growing up on my block, uh, a couple of things. One is, uh, it was, you know, kids can be cruel, I understand that, but I remember kids teasing me about my father and his hook, uh, because back then they, they didn't have the sophisticated prosthetics that they have now. Uh, and so his, his hook was fairly pronounced. I mean, there was no, uh, no way of hiding it. Uh, everyone could see it. And uh, they teased him and teased me about that. And then that was, uh, that was pretty tough to take. Uh, but the other thing I found interesting was he, he never really talked about it much. You know, he came from a generation where you didn't talk about your military service. Uh, you certainly didn't talk about uh, anything like uh, post-traumatic stress, which, uh, you know, is talked about rightfully so now. But back when he was in the military, you just sucked it up and uh, you didn't say anything about it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But I went through most of my life not knowing exactly how my father lost his left hand. And I was, uh, uh, based on his example, uh, which, uh, which he was very patriotic, always talking about uh, serving our country. Uh, based on his example, I enlisted in the Air Force, uh, later got my degree, uh, and at the eight year period in, in my enlisted service, I uh, got my commission. But when I was a colonel, I, I made the grade of colonel in the Air Force and my father obviously was very proud of what I'd accomplished because not only had he served uh, for 20 years, his father, my grandfather had served in World War I and every one of his four brothers served in the military as well. Two of them served for a career. So when I was a colonel, I was uh, in his house. Uh, he was about to ride with me over to the pin-on ceremony. And I hope you can see this. He handed me this book. It's called Firefight at Yichon. And it was by Lieutenant Colonel Charles Bussey, who was his company commander uh, in the Korean War, who had written a book about uh, how a lot of the African-American soldiers in the Korean War did not receive the, the credit and the uh, and the notoriety and, the, and the, the recognition that they should have uh, received because the military had just recently been integrated and they just did not uh, recognize uh, black soldiers for medals and other things as, as they should have. And when I read that book, uh, I was shocked uh, to find out uh, sort of a lifelong secret as to what actually happened to my father. As it turns out, my father uh, was an expert marksman um, and designated as so in the Army. Uh, he was also a heavy equipment operator, and so he drove 
a bulldozer and they cleared roads and, and unfortunately he told me that they, he actually had to, to dig mass graves. Uh, so, uh, you know, he, that was his life, just driving that motorcycle. It was called a D7 bulldozer. And the book, Firefight at Yichon, uh, talks about how uh, my father and another soldier were ordered to drive the bulldozer to a new town, Yichon, which was about 100 miles away. Now, generally, they would have put the, the bulldozer on what they called a flatbed truck, but the flatbed truck was broken. So they had to literally, literally drive this bulldozer. And they, the, the term they used in the book was walking the bulldozer because it moved so slowly. And so my father and his friend, uh, a fellow soldier, were, were chosen uh, based on their, uh, their record of performance to, to conduct that rather dangerous mission uh, in, in Korea uh, because the rest of his company, they, they went on their way and they were, they were alone, essentially. Well, while, while driving the bulldozer uh, at night, uh, they came under fire. And as you can imagine, uh, as my father was on top of the bulldozer and he turned himself away try to, to try to evade the fire, he fell off of the bulldozer. He fell onto the tracks. And instinctively, as the bulldozer continued to move, he pulled himself off the tracks and his left hand was caught and mauled inside of the gears of the bulldozer track. So he laid there on the ground. Uh, it was in the wintertime, it was really cold. Uh, his fellow soldier uh, stopped the bulldozer. Uh, but unfortunately, my father's hand was in such bad shape uh, that he fell into a coma. And you know, those of you that are, have been in the military more recently, you know that our combat uh, search and rescue capability today is, is uh, far superior than it was in those days. Now, if you're injured on the, back, on the battlefield, it's, it's a matter of hours, really, before they can not only get you off the battlefield, but get you into a major hospital. And a matter of, uh, and sometimes less than 24 hours, they can actually have you back, back in the States. Uh, but it is, that wasn't the case during the Korean War. So he literally laid on the battlefield for some time. He was in a coma. They put him on what they called back then an iron lung, which is, uh, essentially a ventilator machine, but it was obviously a lot more crude than we have today. They got him off the battlefield, put him on a ship, and shipped him to Japan, where he went on a British ship off the coast of Japan and had his left hand amputated. They then sent him back to Walter Reed Army Hospital for recovery, uh, which is where I was ironically later born. Um, and, and he recovered there. Now, today, for someone to lose a limb uh, and remain in the military is not all that unusual. But back then, it was. I mean, if you had an injury to that extent, they just discharged you and you went on about your business. And, and he didn't want to go back to the tobacco farm he grew up on. So he petitioned uh, his, his commander and his first sergeant to remain in the army and, and they initially denied it, but he, he made a proposal to them that if he could continue to be a, an expert marksman, if he could qualify to be an expert marksman, even with one hand, one good hand and a hook on, the, on his left hand, that they would allow him to remain in the army. And in fact, they modified uh, his weapon and he did qualify as an expert marksman and he stayed in the army. But rather than uh, continue uh, as an expert marksman, they, because the research for prosthetics was just now getting uh, off the ground, uh, he remained at Walter Reed Army Hospital uh, for his entire career, 20 years, uh, working in prosthetics. Now, keep in mind, I didn't know any of this when I was growing up. Uh, but when my father, I used to visit him, uh, he, there, there was an annex. Uh, to Walter Reed, it was it's called it was called Forest Glen. I think it's still there. And my father worked at Forest Glen in a laboratory uh, that worked on prosthetics. And I, he also didn't tell me. I had to find this out later uh, that the reason that 
Forest Glen existed was because back then, when the black soldiers returned to Walter Reed for recovery, they could get their medical care in the hospital, but the black soldiers were not allowed to remain overnight at Walter Reed. So the black soldiers would get their care during the day and they had to go over to uh, the Forest Glen Annex to, 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 to live, essentially, to eat, uh, to sleep, et cetera. Now, let me back up a second when I talked about uh, PTSD because <clears throat> one of the tougher things I had to discuss with my father was when he turned 80 years old, I was visiting him and I was at this point a, a two-star in the Air Force. Uh, he told me that he had just come from a support group uh, that was helping him deal with uh, the mental anguish he suffered from the Korean War. Uh, and I asked him about that because I said, my God, I mean, you, you know, I didn't realize you had any problems. And growing up, we noticed little things like, uh, you know, during the 4th of July, for example, when fireworks went off, that was bothersome to him. But otherwise, we didn't really notice much uh, in the way of any, uh, you know, any remnants of, of anything he might have suffered in the war. But he said, because back then there was no such acronym as PTSD, because you were told to suck it up, because you would be considered weak if you said anything, because if you went to visit anyone in, in mental health, they would have just discharge you from the army. He didn't say anything, and neither did any of his buddies. So how sad is it that at 80 years old, he finally went to, to get some help? Now, fast forward, uh, he was at my two-star pin-on ceremony. Uh, and then, unfortunately, he got, uh, uh, he had a health issue uh, involving his pancreas, and it wasn't, they never really diagnosed if it was pancreatic cancer or not, but they were concerned enough that uh, they wanted to, re to they, they wanted to perform a, uh, a procedure called a Whipple procedure, which is very complicated, and they normally don't do it for someone his age, and, and, and without going, getting, going into gory details, it, it, it actually re, it, it, it involved the actual removal of his pancreas and part of his stomach and uh, gallbladder, you know, a whole lot of, a whole lot of things. It was just a, a pretty um, a terrible thing to think about. Um, and I remember talking to him uh, just as he went in to surgery and, uh, you know, <laughs> He was a lot uh, stronger and more uh, practical than I am. Uh, he had made peace with the fact that, you know, he may not uh, pull through the surgery. He was okay with it, but he told me as the oldest uh, of six children that he, uh, he told me as the oldest of six children, he was, depending on me to carry on the family, to be the one that kept everybody together. And he said, because of that, and because he was so proud of what I had accomplished, that um, he, he felt he was good. If he did not make it through the surgery, he was happy. And, I, and he had a smile on his face as they willed him in the, in the, the, uh, into surgery. To make a long story short, they did the surgery. Uh, it was tough for him. He stayed in... Uh, uh, he stayed in the ICU for a, 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 an unusual amount of time, um, and he 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 never he never came home from that surgery. He he bounced up and down uh, with different episodes. Uh, I, I got called. I was working in the Pentagon at the time. Um, you know, I've got called several times. You need to get over here. Your father's not doing well. He's not going to make it. I'd get over. He would bounce back, and we thought he was going to be okay. And he just never. Uh, he just never was able to recover. During that time, I had been notified that of my selection for a third star. And, and those of you who are in the military uh, understand that, you know, when you get nominated for a promotion, uh, all officer promotions are confirmed by the Senate, but general officer promotions in particular, uh, you know, it's, it's a very involved process. And you know, the, the president has announced you, you have to go over to, to Congress and get confirmed. And, and it's one of those things that you can't presume confirmation. And, and, and they're very careful about telling you, don't talk about 
your promotion. We're going to tell you you're on the list, but don't talk about it because we don't want you to presume confirmation. That's the Senate has sole, uh, sole authority over that. So I was in talking to my father one day and I'd known I, I knew I was being promoted, but I, I didn't tell him out of respect for what my boss told me. Obviously, that's something I regret uh, today. I, I wish I had told him. Uh, but the last time we had a conversation, we, he was in Walter Reed Hospital and I was there with him. And he, I don't know why, you know, I, I'm not ready to go as far as to say he knew uh, he wasn't going to make it. I, I'm, I'm not ready to say that. I don't know. Uh, but he talked to me about his military service in a way that he never had before. And he told me how tough it was to enter the military when it was still segregated and how awful that he and his, uh, his friends were treated uh, and how they did not, even though they were legally, uh, the, the, the military was legally uh, by, by presidential executive order, uh, integrated that, that that was not the practice. Uh, and so uh, it was really tough for he and his friends. Uh, you know, the, and they think a lot of harassment, most of them, the only jobs they could get was as cooks and, uh, and things of that nature. He was actually fortunate to be a heavy equipment operator. Uh, and he told me how tough things had been. And he said, you know, he was glad that, that I was doing so well and that he was, you know, no one in his family had ever been an officer in the military, much less a general officer. And, and he was beside himself. Um, and so uh, it, it was tough for me to hear uh, how difficult he had it. Uh, and I really wanted to tell him, you know, Dad, just so you know, I, you know, I got another promotion, but I, I, I didn't. And again, that's something I, if I could go back, I, I would do that. Not because of me, but because I know how it would make him feel. I have no idea how, what his reaction would be if he was allowed to see me pin on the fourth star. We think, when I think about Father's Day, obviously, um, you know, that's what I think about. My, my father dedicated most of his life to the military, to the U.S. Army. Uh, he loved the Army, despite the hardships he had to endure when he came in. Uh, keep in mind, I came of age uh, during the Vietnam War, and uh, you know, it was, it was anti-establishment, anti-military, uh, all of that. Uh, and you know, none of my friends wanted anything to do with the military. But he kept telling me, you know, that you know, for a guy that grew up on a tobacco farm, you know, coming in the army was the best thing he could have done. I mean, he, he got to learn things he never would have learned. He got to meet people he never would have met and he got to serve his country. Uh, and that was important to him. And whereas he never wanted to put any pressure on any of us uh, to join the military, he was, he was really proud that I had. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, he was beside himself that, uh, that I'd been become a general officer. Um, so, um, I owe him uh, so much, uh, in, not only in terms of, uh, of what he meant to me and my family, uh, but the fact that he instilled in me a, a sense of patriotism, uh, despite uh, the fact that, you know, our country is the greatest country on earth, uh, but it, it is on a journey toward a more perfect union. It's not perfect yet. And despite the problems we have, uh, you know, he instilled, uh, he, he instilled a, a, a commitment and a dedication in me to do whatever I can to make our country better and to help it along that journey of becoming a more perfect union. Um, so a Father's Day for me is, uh, you know, a time when I reflect back. Uh, I think about uh, growing up with my father uh, when I was a kid uh, over in Southeast DC, uh, watching him come, come home in his uniform. I reflect back on the kids that teased him and teased me uh, about his hook that he had on, on his arm or, or in place of his left hand. Uh, I think back uh, when I, uh, and this was really tough for me, when I uh, graduated officer training school, and he came and picked me up at the airport. I was still in uniform and, and he was, and I was the second lieutenant. And 
back then, you know, this was before 9-11, obviously. So back then you could pull the car right up to the front of the airport and, and get out. Uh, and he pulled the car up to pick me up. Before I could get in the car, he jumped out of the car. He ran around to where out the other side, the passenger side, and he saluted me and he said, congratulations, Lieutenant. Um, that, that was tough for me to watch um, and to see the pride on his face uh, uh, that he had in me that I'd become the first member of our family to become an officer. Now, when we got in the car, he got a little more serious by saying, now look, you know, just because you're a lieutenant, you're a lieutenant don't think you're all that because you know, and you better never forget, the backbone and the strength of the military is the enlisted corps, and you better never, never forget that. Uh, and any of you that know me, you know that I never did. I, I focused most of my attention as an officer, trying my best to support uh, and help our enlisted force because they are, in fact, and continue to be the backbone of the military. Uh, today, uh, you know, now that I'm retired, um, you know, occasionally I look through pictures uh, uh, of my father, particularly when I have my family over and reflect back on his service, reflect back on my own service. Uh, uh, and having been brought up in the church uh, as a Christian, I, I believe that, uh, you know, he did know that I, or he does know that I was selected for a third star when I was talking to him. He does know that I was able to achieve four stars and, and he's watching over me and my family uh, yet today. So that, uh, I, I firmly believe that. So uh, Michael, thank you so much for, uh, for allowing me to talk about my father uh, on Father's Day. Uh, Rodney, thank you so much for what you're doing uh, to promote uh, uh, not only veterans with your Veterans in Transition program uh, and me personally by allowing me to uh, interview uh, folks on the Generally Speaking series that you conduct. Uh, if that's an honor for me to be able to interview uh, folks in the military and those that are retired. Uh, but uh, most of all, I, I think uh, all of you that participated in this program, I got to, I'm looking forward to hearing all of your stories about your parents, your mothers, your fathers, your uncles, your aunts that were a part of the military or, that, or your kids that are part of the military now. So thank you very much. You know, I, one last thing, I, <laughs> I was thinking uh, before the program came, in, came on that, you know, having been brought up in the Baptist church, uh, one of the busiest Sundays in the, in the church was Mother's Day when it was packed and, you know, everyone, all the women had on their nice hats and, and you always had a guest speaker and you could barely get in the door. Uh, whereas on Father's Day, there was, it was no, pl no problem getting a seat. So <laughs> I'm not sure why that is. Um, so, I, I, by the way, that's the way it should be. Uh, but I, I want to thank you, Rodney, for recognizing Father's Day and particularly recognizing those fathers uh, and sons and daughters and mothers uh, that served in the military. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it.